Hey, I'm Alex with Pocket Bard, and I'm here with James with Worldcraft Club. Hey. So I'm here talking to James today about uh, world building, and I reached out to him before the convention we're at, DaiGeekCon, and I wanted to connect with other people in the kind of tabletop world building space. Mm -hmm. And the thing you guys have got going on with Worldcraft Club is really neat. So if you Thanks. could tell me a little bit about like the world craft or the world building journal you have yeah, and yeah, yeah, the yeah. podcast. I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, so I mean, we started out as a podcast and community about two years back. I think it was like 2019 when we got this started, maybe late 2018. And we just started recording a bunch of episodes talking about world building. I originally started it because I was kind of of this mentality that I, I kind of wanted to rag on single biome planets a lot. And I had a bunch <laughs> of like these like, you know, why is the lonely mountain? Like it doesn't make any geological sense. It's like Tolkien's the best. Why did he put this here? Like all this kind of stuff. But as we started to like interview people and talk to them, we started to see that a lot of the best creatives, even folks like Tolkien and Frank Herbert and others were, um, really creating worlds that were based around their passions. And they had a central kind of vibe that they were going for. They, they kind of created a, a core concept and seemed to just build off the back of it. Um, we noticed that this really was some of the most beautiful world building I'd seen. And like, it wasn't about the details, you know? We spent a lot of time kind of diving into it, thinking about it, trying to decide what we wanted to do. And eventually we came up with the World Builders Journal, right? So we love pen and paper. Uh, I love OneNote. I love all that kind of stuff as well. Like, you know, it's great for note geek taking, but there's something about just writing stuff down. So we found these disc journals where you can rip pages out, put them back in, and we developed the World Builders Journal, which is uh, a way that just sort of distills a lot of this sort of meaning-centered world building into a, uh, into a really simple system that anybody can follow. We, we don't want to see more creatives get lost in, in world building or writing out a constructed language or something and like forgetting what's really important about how they connect with their audience. So I, I really fun. like that because it, it's, it's kind of leading towards a, a pushing them towards the important things like you said, you know, yeah, and having yeah. these, this kind of modularity where as you're going you can put things in and out and yeah, you know, take, out. take yeah. players ideas and oh, put yeah. those in. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's it's just a really cool concept, and I really like it. And yeah, I'm, I'm thank you. glad to, to encounter you guys. So yeah. um, can you tell me a little bit about what you think makes world building good, right? Like, what kind of direction are you steering people in? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, the, the thing is, is, like, you can start out with a setting, and you, you can have a pretty good idea about what you're making. and. The real first goal of any setting is, is to create immersion, right? It's almost like the Hippocratic Oath, first, do no harm. Don't <laughs> yank people out of the story, right? Like make something that fits with the story that you're trying to tell or contrast with it in a way that people can see that. Um, but I think really the world building that goes beyond that is world building that focuses on wonder, right? Like this idea that there is something just beyond. So our theory essentially is that really it's your, it's your players, it's your readers, that create the setting. You only lay out the signposts and breadcrumbs. It's a little bit like a spaghetti western. You see, you know, a facade up there. You've got a tavern. You've got people yelling. You've got glasses smashing. You've got gunshots going off. Your reader looks at that. They see a saloon. They don't see a facade with wooden scaffolding behind it. That's really what we're doing when we're world building is we're trying to create something that someone's going to look at and imagine the rest. It's a little bit like that conspiracy theories are popular for this reason. People look for stories everywhere. So what we suggest is that we leverage that, right? Like actually create the breadcrumbs in there, let your readers expand on it. Don't feel the need to explain everything. It's partly about respecting them as well and giving them the agency to sort of expand. But what's more is world building isn't just about what you know, but what you don't know. It's not just about being in a place, but being able to look at the horizon and go, I wonder what's over there. Most of the exciting moments that you can imagine, like Lord of the Rings, like the Argonauts, right? They're rolling down the river Anduin, they look up and they see these two kings stood with their hands outstretched, these enormous stone statues. That is breathtaking. People look at that and they go, oh my gosh, why are there no people there? Like, <laughs> why is Aragorn excited to come here? There's, you just know there's history, right? Now, anybody that reads into it, you know Tolkien's got a whole explanation for it, but in the moment, all we see is these statues and we are left with wonder. Tolkien's world just lived off the back of wonder. You were always looking along the horizon. It's what you didn't know that drew you in. So a good world immerses you. A great world has you experiencing wonder. That's really interesting. I feel like that also works for really what's brought Star Wars and, and maintained it for oh, so yeah. long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just ever Super since the original. Exactly. Yeah. And just the books that people have written, all the fan fiction, yeah. all the theories have just kept kept the momentum going, kept yeah. the interest there. And if it had just all been explained, 
what would people have to talk about after the content was delivered. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of it kind of came from just production realities as well. Yeah. As they used to have blue lightsabers, but when they were on Jabba's skiff and they had a blue sky behind them, they couldn't use blue lightsabers, so that's why Luke has a green lightsaber. And uh, <laughs> then we have purple lightsabers because uh, Samuel L. Jackson likes purple, and he asked George Lucas to give him a purple lightsaber. We have the technology, so we did it, and thus, lightsaber lore was born. It didn't exist before then. It was just sweet laser swords. And like, the thing that amazes me is how people, how people expand on the settings they love. We're in, a, we're in a convention right now. People are dressing up as their favorite characters. People imagine themselves in these roles and they expand on the world themselves. This is why fan fiction exists. Even something like Harry Potter, right? Mega soft world building, right? We're totally soft. Makes, a lot of it is just way out there. But, People imagine those worlds expanding in their heads. They write the fan fiction. They want to imagine how it goes because they know that if it's in Harry Potter, it's going to be quaint and cute. And if you can imagine quaint and cute, you can expand that world however far you want because you understand what she was going for. You know? Yeah, that's really that's a really good insight. It's like not putting all these rules on people's imaginations. Yeah, right. Let, let them imagine. Let yeah. them imagine. Right, because <laughs> they're the best at doing it for them. Yeah. Right. You can't like it's it's setting up a platform for them to continue. Yeah. Basically. And, and, and like real talk, how often do your players come up with better ideas than you when you're <laughs> when you're doing it? It's like it's like you run a session and your players come up with a conspiracy theory. You're like, yes, that's what happened. <laughs> you know, that's it. You nailed it. That's planned it all along. Exactly. You know? Like, let your audience build your world for you. There's a lot of it. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, one of the things I wanted to hit on, kind of the cross section of where we're both at, is you know I tell stories and try to create worlds with music. Yeah. And yeah. I, I was interested to hear from you what some of the good examples of world building done through yeah. music yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, what, what are some of your top ones, and oh, why do you think so? For sure, the, the Imperial March, yeah. right? Like, anytime you start hearing that, like you get this sort of militarized theme, you've got the steady rhythm, you can imagine people sort of goose-stepping to it, there's a menace behind it, and I, I honestly think that's a really effective yeah. world-building tool, because you can sort of imagine an Imperial band actually playing that while they're marching along, yeah. and it's, it gives you the sense of dread and menace and lets you sort of frame what's going on so quickly. It's like a great shortcut. Uh, another good example, Lord of the Rings, you know, concerning hobbits, right at the beginning, yeah. this like playful violin, it's like, you know that you're not about to pan onto a murder scene. You know, it's like, it, you, you know what you're looking at because the music <laughs> kind of leads you into that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you can discern so much from the Imperial March, right? Like, oh, yeah. from the first three notes. Oh, like, yeah. having it in, like, a march, te march meter, you know, with yeah. a, a, just a, like, very rigid tempo. Like, oh, you, love already, you know the you music know. words. That's yeah. the best part. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it, but within two measures, you already know what's being set up. Yeah. And the same thing, you hear the, like, uh, like Irish whistle come in for, in concerning yeah, Hobbits, and yeah, you already yeah, know yeah. you're already now in a like Ireland you've got a Celtic, you've got a Celtic, Celtic in, sort of yeah exactly. yeah vibe. I love it in, yeah. in like two measures right, right? Yeah. and and a lot of um, uh, like music uh, idea is when you're trying to do music sales or get hook people yeah. it needs to happen within the first few seconds oh, right geez. it needs yeah, to yeah, be yeah, like yeah. measure one you already understand what's going on yeah, yeah. right or, and are hooked by something whether it's where it brings you or a melody or motif and i think both star wars and lord of the rings do a really good job with that right yeah. any of the themes like rohan's themes oh, just violin yeah. immediately you know where yeah, you yeah, are yeah, yeah, yeah. you know the vibe the key makes it so kind of like empty and somber yeah, 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 yeah. and and in, in, in my opinion, the, the Lord of the Rings soundtrack would probably be a fairly good example of soft music world building. Yeah. yeah because yeah, yeah. it's not too in your face. Yeah. It's fairly minimalist in terms of what it needs to be, right? It doesn't overstay its welcome. Yeah. It's focused on the characters. It's focused on the narrative. It's focused on just getting you a basic vibe. But it doesn't necessarily have to... It, like the score in general, I don't think has is quite as intrusive. on the nose yeah. or intrusive as yeah. it could have been. That's, that's 100 percent right. Because like I, I honestly think it's like the way I like to think about it is almost graphically. It's like a line of best fit, right? Like what you're kind of doing is you're giving the first few data points for your audience to look at a situation, and then they kind of draw the line of best fit and figure out what the rest of the world is going to look like. And they start drawing a dotted line at the end. They start imagining what's coming. You know what I mean? And that that's exactly what that music does. Is it sets them up. Yeah. gets them in the right mode for it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. exactly. No, that's, that's really cool. Uh, yeah. I think, I mean, those probably would be my top two examples too, partly because they also have, uh, especially Star Wars, yeah, yeah. just 
has such an adventurous like it not only it's playful like it, it needs to be playful yeah it is and it helps you to not take the world as seriously and it helps it helps you to not maybe in the originals or prequels or I, any of them i guess yeah not be as critical right yeah. because yeah, yeah, yeah. like it's fantastical if something doesn't make sense it's the music helps, exactly you know, it's like yeah, yeah it helps yeah, yeah. you not be like that wouldn't happen yeah. it, it all plays together both for for functionality and um and you know like thematic purpose yeah the basics of how to how do people connect with you um, oh, yeah. Where can they get the World Building Journal, and what are you guys up to next? Sure. I mean, we're at worldcraftclub.com, so you can jump on there. There you can find our podcast, World Builders Journal, and other stuff that we make, as well as get access to our Discord community. That's where a lot of the action really happens. So, yeah, I mean, that's the best place to go, worldcraftclub.com, all one word. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, we're at Pocket Bard, so if you want to follow us, uh, there's a link tree. You can find us on Instagram, Google Play, iOS, yeah. so anywhere that... That Google will take you. <laughs> so again, thanks, James. I appreciate oh, it. Yeah, thanks, man. Love it.